Hello, and welcome to, More Intelligent Tomorrow. A wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. Can we reopen confidently with rapid at-home testing? We'll discuss this and more with Michael Minna, on today's episode. And now, your host, Sally Embry. All right. So today we have Dr. Michael Minna on the podcast LinkedIn Live with us. And so I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for being here. And I won't call you Dr. Minna again after this. I'll probably just call you Mike for the rest of the call since we've known each other for a while. But I just wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself as well for, I mean, you don't really need an introduction. I think probably most people know who you are by now. You've been on pretty much every major media source in the US. But yeah, if you could just take a second to to introduce yourself, that would be great. Sure. I'm Michael Minna. I'm a faculty member at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist and immunologist and also a physician at Harvard Medical School where I oversee uh, molecular virology diagnostics, which uh, all of those combined have, have come into focus during this pandemic. Mike's what I like to call a doctor doctor. He's an MD, PhD, <laughs> so, <laughs> a super doctor. <laughs> Um, and he's been leading the way in terms of being a vocal advocate for antigen testing when it comes to fighting COVID-19. Um, how did you find yourself getting into that, Mike? How did you find yourself getting into that fight? It really started in January or so of 2020, of course. Um, uh, uh, normally what I do, what my lab does and uh, is monitor uh, people's immune systems and immune responses uh, in part for understanding basic biology of, of infections, but also uh, we use the immune system as a way to monitor outbreaks and we couple all of this immunological data and these technologies that we develop around uh, immune responses and we use them in epidemiologic frameworks. Um, so that put us... Uh, and I put a lot of my research at the beginning, just sort of obviously COVID was relevant and we were modeling some aspects of COVID back in, in January. Um, and at the same time, I was, uh, because I oversee viral diagnostics at Brigham Women's Hospital, one of, um, one of the teaching hospitals that Harvard has, uh, it led to, you know, b b my modeling work essentially got us, uh, get me very involved with like January and February, I was trying to convince the hospital to start testing. Um, most of the hospital leadership uh, laughed at me and, and said, why would we test for coronavirus? Um, why would we create this test? So that uh, immediately got me started thinking, okay, you know, <laughs> the hospitals aren't going to move quickly and, uh, and this virus is going to be upon us very quickly. Uh, so I went to the Broad Institute and started um, a big testing operation, a PCR laboratory-based testing operation at the Broad. And now that's probably the largest or at least highest throughput laboratory in the country. Um, uh, but even that, even, you know, working with the Broad and their amazing teams there to get testing, you know, to be, you know, do over 100,000 tests a day in this one lab, it, um, it was readily apparent that that still wasn't going to be enough. So it led me down this whole new area of science of trying to understand what are new approaches to testing, how can testing morph from, uh, from essentially a diagnostic medical tool to a true mitigation strategy and public health tool, and, and what kind of tests would we need to be able to make that a reality. And so that's sort of the, the, short, the short story of how, uh, how we're, we ended up talking here, I would suppose. <laughs> <laughs> And then, I mean, so where we're at now, essentially, it's been over a year, uh, which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, there's multiple at-home tests hitting the market or have hit the market and been approved. There's probably many more on the way. Um, or you know there's many more on the way. Um, how do you feel about the outlook of these tests going forward? So now a lot of people say, well, okay, you know, unfortunately, we didn't get these tests available to help mitigate spread for, for the fall and winter. What's the point now we have vaccines? And uh, the point is still more or less the same. Uh, although we're having a lot of people who are protected, uh, we still have opportunity to stop local spread. The need for testing is sort of dropping because incidence is dropping. But at the same time, the need for testing is in a different way opening is increasing because businesses are finally saying, okay, we want to just open up. Schools are saying we want to open up. And, and the way to do that the most safely is to have screening 
program set up. Were you excited to see the new guidelines around screening? Yeah, well, certainly um, the guidance coming from the CDC this past week, I think, was a welcomed uh, set of guidance. I'm always wanting the, the language to be more clear, um, but taking the CDC's perspective, I think uh, they're in a pretty tough spot right now. The CDC and the White House have both made it very clear that they want rapid testing available. Unfortunately, CDC has to be tempered in its ability to, or in its sort of suggestion of using rapid tests, because it recognizes that rapid tests just simply aren't yet available. They could be, but they're not yet available to, to most Americans. And so they're creating guidance, which is sort of a hybrid around, this is what you could do for screening with rapid tests, but this is also what you could do with screening if you're sending your tests out to a laboratory to get pooled and, and processed and returned in one or two days. So those are two very different approaches to screening. Um, but at the moment, we don't really have another option. Most of the testing still has to be PCR based. Are there things that people could do at home to help encourage move things along? I know you were part of like an open letter initiative and you've been, I, you know, I kind of joked at the top that you've been on every major <laughs> media podcast or, uh, yeah. So I know you've been a vocal person around the or a vocal advocate for this, but you know, what can people be doing to try to express support for this? Is that even an option? It is. Uh, it's, it's hard to know sort of, uh, I mean, the short answer is yes, it's certainly an option. Um, People can let their Congress people, let their senators, let their representatives know that they are wanting to be able to, you know, test at home before they go to work, test their kids at home before they go to school. And business leaders can, can, you know, push this idea that, hey, they don't need to, these entities, a school shouldn't necessarily be forced to become a laboratory. You know, um, schools by and large, don't want to be doing this. They don't want to be putting, forcing their nurses to be dealing with thousands of swabs every day. Um, they would much rather see uh, people test at home. So I guess backing up for a second, like when it comes to screening, can you help define, like, I, I know there's a lot of confusion around these different categories. Can you define what screening is and, and what makes it different and why is it important? Sure. So screening uh, can take multiple forms. Um, there's diagnostic there's diagnostic testing for on the one hand, and then there's public health testing. Diagnostic testing is what we normally think about as testing. It's you go to a doctor, you get a prescription, you get a test. Diagnostic testing is not the type of testing we need during a pandemic, but it is the only type of testing we have thus far authorized for the most part during this pandemic. Every single test that's been that's been given in the United States for the most part uh, during this pandemic has been diagnostic. There's been some doctor's signature. Most of the time, people don't even know who that doctor is. And that doctor is getting paid and it raises costs and it limits access to testing. What the country really needs and what the world needs to mitigate spread of a virus like this is not expensive medical diagnostic testing. It's public health testing. And there's multiple types of public health testing. Uh, screening, I think, is one of the most... Uh, is one of the most powerful, in particular frequent screening. So this is uh, this is a, a form of testing where people could test themselves, especially if they had these rapid paper strip type of antigen tests, they could test themselves multiple times a week, say twice, two or three times a week. And that would be enough so that if somebody is exposed and is infected and maybe doesn't know it, they find themselves as positive and they're empowered to actually take uh, the initiative to isolate themselves, to not go and infect their family members and their loved ones and their coworkers. Uh, that's the type of screening that can really bend the arc uh, of, the, of, an, of an outbreak, keep outbreaks from arising. So a lot of the technology around this is, you know, we've discussed before, like lateral flow assays, which are, are not new. They're new. They're, <laughs> they've been around for a while. Um, so, you know, what has kept getting that solution out the door? You know, there's there need to be more innovation in the space. And if so, like, what type of innovation is required? There's a lot of tests that are working just fine. The innovation really needs to be out the regulatory side of things. Um, we have to innovate our regulations to keep up with a pandemic like this. The tests are working just fine. Uh, and actually, we, we know that they're working just fine because we have a couple that are actually authorized to be used. Uh, Abbott has their Binex now and Quidel has the quick view. So the tests, but the tests are there is the point. And what's not there to get these things in use are, are two pieces. One is the regulatory landscape needs to change and I can discuss that. The other is certainly 
how to report results from uh, a test. Now there's different philosophies about whether reporting is needed, should be possible, should be, you know, how it should be done. Especially for tests being performed at home, we don't want to go, we don't want to go dark and have no idea what's happening at the population level. So we want some reporting, but I would argue that we want voluntary reporting. We want super simple voluntary reporting uh, for at least some parts. Some people won't won't test specifically because they don't want to report. And that's reasonable. We don't have catchment. We don't have like economic catchment, uh, you know, nets to catch people who need to isolate. So we can't go and ask somebody who needs to quarantine or isolate to do so if they're if it means that they're going to go hungry. There's a number of pieces that still haven't been put in place this far. You know, we have half a million dead and we still haven't acted in an appropriate way that's commensurate with this pandemic, um, with the exception of vaccines. Uh, so I guess to, to back up, I think what needs to happen from a test perspective is the test technology is there. The regulatory landscape, I think, needs to come up with a new, the FDA needs to come up with a new approach to understand how to regulate a test that is not a medical diagnostic test, but whose actual sole purpose or, or main purpose is to prevent population spread. Now people are starting to say, okay, before we get ahead of ourselves, we need reporting. And that's where, you know, my opinion is where companies like DataRobot com come in and, you know, you're good dealing with data and reporting and you could probably develop really good reporting structures. Creating the software that will enable these tests to move forward, that will enable sort of one-click reporting to any public health agency based on geolocation or something like that, uh, would be an incredible advance. Right now, we've seen pretty poor quality apps be developed with these tests, and that's because the apps, the again regulation, has required that the app, that the that the test manufacturers get into the software space, which doesn't make much sense to force that for them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So I think that those are some of the issues that, that really need to be tackled right now. Yeah, we feel pretty passionately about reporting. And we actually, so we, we are going to be seeking FDA EUA authorization for the contagion net test, but we are going to have to follow the reporting guidelines. But our original vision for contagion net, one that we want to kind of hold on to, to a certain degree, just to be able to show people like what is possible was actually designed around anonymous test reporting. So an individual doesn't have to share that much information about them, but we still understand where outbreaks are occurring. So you can actually be responsive. And then that person doesn't have the stigma associated with them in terms of uh, being a positive case. We had a couple examples, really interesting examples of when volunteers were using uh, the contagion net system where they would essentially like test positive and then they were like, we always recommend that you go get a confirmatory PCR. And they'd be like, can I just like hunker down at my house? <laughs> like, they're like, I won't leave for 10 days, but I just don't want anybody to know. I don't want this to like potentially prevent me from getting the vaccine in a couple months. Um, and so they really wanted to, you know, just make sure that they, they didn't want to be on the record as someone with, with COVID. They wanted to be uh, they, they were willing to like take the right actions at the right time, but they didn't want that label, essentially. That's exactly what we found in, in surveys of Americans. And, uh, and that's exactly what a number of us have been calling for. I mean, exactly that. Uh, we should make testing. You know, there are a lot of Americans that don't want to get tested just because, because they don't want to be reported with their, with their name. And this, is, this should be totally fine. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not, you know, it depends on where people lie in their sort of societal beliefs with medical information. But we have taught people from the time they're babies in this country to not give up their medical information. We've created safeguards so that medical information never leaves the individual and the, and the doctor. And then an epidemic comes around and we just assume, expect people to be willing to give up all of their medical information or the, these pieces. You know, that was a, that was a, a terrible oversight uh, on the part of America to assume that Americans should just be willing to do this. So instead, we saw exactly what you're getting. We saw people decide not to get tested at all because they didn't want to be reported. And I, my personal feeling is that the option for fully anonymous testing makes so much sense. The barrier to it is that we have a lot of public health agencies that can't see their way around a different approach to testing. Uh, traditionally, testing has been considered a means to just do contact tracing. And it's been considered that contact tracing is the intervention. 
and testing is just to allow public health agencies and it's sort of a top-down approach. But the advent of rapid testing uh, and the rollout of wide-scale rapid testing can flip that entirely on its head. We don't need contact tracing to be the end-all be-all. If we have enough people doing rapid tests on their own anyway, then people will find out on their own much quicker than any contact tracer would get to them that they're positive. It can be fully anonymous, can still report all of the data to public health agencies who want to, re who want to monitor the epidemic. But the contact tracing bit can be dropped out because if you really scale these things up, the point of contact tracing is just to tell people that they need to get tested. Do you think for, I guess, for this pandemic, you know, I know many of us don't believe that this pandemic is over. There's going to be still a long road for the couple months ahead, maybe even years ahead. Um, but is that a way to think about future pandemic preparedness as well? How will we change the regulatory mechanisms going forward? Is, is that an opportunity or is there other methods that would be more beneficial when we think about pandemic preparedness? No, I mean, I think we'd be um, remarkably short-sighted if we don't if we don't take this opportunity to think of new ways to deal with uh, an epidemic, you know, I'm, I'm, there's a part of me that's like losing faith quickly that we ever will because, you know, because we are a year over a year into this and we have half a million people dead and we've barely moved the needle in terms of our regulatory uh, landscape. You know, pandemics are becoming more common, not less, and they'll continue to become more common, not less. And so, I think building this infrastructure today to to have you know the ability to scale up rapid testing uh, is essential. If we're not, you know, testing is so is crucial to to being able to just understand so many aspects of a pandemic, um, where it is, how fast it's moving, who it's hitting quickest, what are whether our, our other efforts are actually working or not working. If we're not testing, we're blind, and we don't want to be blind in a pandemic. One of the jokes that we've made throughout this pandemic and throughout our work has been you have been required to do everything at home over the past year. You have to work from home, teach your kids from home, grocery shop from home. But when it comes to getting a COVID test, the time where you're probably most contagious or most worried about being contagious, we need you to leave your home. Right? <laughs> I know it's just insane, isn't it? Just crazy. It's so crazy. I've I've thought about that myself, and it's just it just shows how short sighted our policies have been. I mean, frankly, and and you know these are really basic basic things that you just said. Like like a kindergartner should understand that, and yet we've had policy that has done exactly the wrong thing. I mean, it's. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's just been, it's been astounding. Yeah. I am just continually blown away. <laughs> so, well, even thinking, and I, I don't know what your kind of global, I know back when we were friends, you had a global health background as well. So I am curious if you've thought about this from a global health perspective too, you know, many countries, developing countries are not going to have access to the vaccine anytime soon. Do you see this as a solution that can kind of be lifted and shifted to other countries as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I've been trying to work with a few entities to try to get some rapid tests into other, other countries, and really they're just for hospital-based work. I mean, most countries don't even have the capacity to do, you know, just just testing for their patients in the hospitals. And um, uh, so we've been developing all different types of tools, different pooling strategies that we've published, but also I think rapid testing, getting these very inexpensive test to the world is is absolutely essential. There's no reason why we shouldn't be pushing that. I think it it behooves us to, I mean, we should absolutely be doing that from, you know, even if it's purely selfish, uh, the more we can limit spread globally, the, the better off we'll be locally. So thank you so much, Mike, for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time and giving your insights and expertise when it comes to this important topic. Um, and yeah, thank you for carving out time for Data Robot today. Well, thanks a lot and thanks for everything you guys are doing and, you know, building building more of a science around how these tests can be used and, and a platform for them. I think uh, I'm excited to see where, where uh, ContagionNet uh, lands. <laughs> Thank you.